Hey guys, so excited to be with you on this 4W Life journey together. Uh, really at the heart of this 4W Life is, is hopefully a desire to bring clarity around what it looks like to make disciples. You see, the mission of our church is to glorify God by making disciples. And in order for us to make something, we've got to be really clear on what it is we're, we're making. I think back to a Christmas where I put together a kitchen set for our kids and uh, it took me way longer than I thought it would. It took me about four hours. It was, oh man, it was a pain. But I was able to get through it and I was able to do it because I knew exactly what I was making. I had really clear instructions and I knew what it was that I was doing. And yet I think often with discipleship, we can have a lot of fuzziness around it. Like, what, what does it mean? How do I make a disciple? And I, I would not be surprised if we asked 20 different people in our church, what is a disciple and how do you make one if we got 20 different answers? And so a big part of the goal around this 4W life is that we begin to understand and get a lot more clarity around what is a disciple. And as we know what a disciple is, it's going to help us know how do we make one? How do we make disciples? We believe that is what God has called us to, uh, not just for a season, but for our lifetime to pour ourselves out for making disciples. And so we would answer that by just saying it's the 4W life. What is a disciple? It's someone who worships Christ. They walk with Christ. They work for Christ and they witness for Christ. They are someone who abides with Jesus and they do that by worshiping him and walking with him and, and they obey Jesus and they, they do that through working and witnessing about Christ. And so I want to talk a little bit about this worship uh, principle, but then most of our time around the worship practices. And so worship principle, let's start with that. To worship Christ, what does that mean? And we're going to say it this way. Really, worship is the response of praise and adoration to God because of who God is. Worship is the response of praise and adoration to God because of who God is. And that's it. Worship is the response of praise and adoration to God because of who God is. And so I want to just kind of break this down a little bit piece by piece. So worship is a response. What's that mean? Worship is a response. It's a reaction. This means that worship doesn't start with us. Worship doesn't start with me. Worship doesn't start with you. Worship starts with God. We don't manufacture it within our hearts. The, the, the reality is worship happens as we get close to God, as we have an encounter with God, as we gaze upon his beauty and his power and his righteousness and his justice and his love and his mercy and his grace. And, and as we begin to more and more fall in love with God, we worship him. We respond. Worship is a response because of who God is is. And so in order to respond to something, we've got to be close to it. We've got to be experiencing it. And so the whole heart of worshiping Christ starts with this idea that we are responding to who God is, that we are drawing near to Jesus consistently, persistently. We are pursuing Christ. And so worship is a response. It's the response, but, but a response of, of what? What are we to respond with? Well, Worship is the response of praise and adoration to God. With praise and adoration to God. And, and, and as we talk, we're going to unpack that this praise and adoration to God is more than just an hour or two on a Sunday morning. That this is a response of a life of praise and adoration to God. A, a, a life that is lived with admiration of God, with love and respect and affection and reverence. We give God everything we have. We live lives of praise and adoration to the Lord. This is our whole life. We're going to talk about this includes singing, but it's so much more than just singing with some people on a Sunday morning for 30 minutes a week. It's an intentional pursuit of knowing more about Jesus. And, and so what is worship? Worship is the response of praise and adoration to God because of who God is. But we're going to focus the rest of our time on not what it is, but on what does this look like? Uh, practically now, okay, we know it's a response of praise and adoration to God because of who God is, but 
But now let's talk about what's, what does that mean for, for me as I wake up on a Tuesday morning and I'm tired and what does it mean to worship Christ? What does that look like? It's, it's Thursday night, I'm putting the kids to bed again and uh, it's time to brush their teeth and for me, man, that brings out the worst in me. What, what does it mean for me to worship Christ in those moments? We wanna unpack that together. And so three uh, practices that we're gonna talk about that are gonna foster a greater uh, worship in our hearts, that are gonna foster a greater response of praise and adoration to God because of who God is. And so uh, three practices that we're gonna commit to together, they're gonna build some of that heart of worship in us. And number one is this, that I am actively participating in the Sunday morning worship gatherings. Now we're gonna talk about worship as a lot more than just the Sunday morning gathering, but we wanna realize that this commitment starts with the Sunday morning gathering that there's a commitment to actively participating in the Sunday morning worship gathering. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. What does it mean uh, actively participating? And we really wanna emphasize this because I, I think the Capital C Church and maybe particularly the Capital C Church in America has, um, I, I would argue, set the bar too low. We've set the bar too low and we've become okay with um, passive attenders. That man, as long as you're walking through the door and you come and you sit in a seat on a Sunday morning and, and you're just here for an hour, we're, we're good with that. And maybe, hey, maybe if you could just give a little bit, uh, help with the budget a little bit and um, I don't know, maybe, maybe show up and, and you know, if you want to, you can, you can greet or whatever, but, but we don't wanna, we don't wanna push you too hard. We don't wanna make you too uncomfortable. So if nothing else, man, just, just come, just attend. And we're saying we're not okay with the passive attender. We're not okay with the uninvolved spectator. We want to raise the bar that we would say, hey, for any of us that are going to be part of the church family, part of what it means to foster a heart of worship is we are actively participating in the Sunday morning gathering. This means that I'm coming to Sunday morning not with a uh, sit back and watch attitude, but a lean in and participate. So, so what's that mean? That means that I'm going to come ready to sing. Let's just get really practical. I'm going to come ready to sing. And notice, I didn't, I didn't say, I'm gonna come ready to sing well. That some of us, you, you, you might be sitting there, you're going, bro, I can't, I can't sing. I can't, I don't, I don't have a voice. Like, but you know what? Time and time and time again in scripture, God calls us to sing to him. And hardly ever does he say, sing well. He just says, sing. And so we are to bring a song to the Lord. And that's all of us, regardless of if you have a great voice or a, a terrible voice, if you can't carry a tune or you sound amazing, God calls us to sing. And so when we come together on Sunday mornings, we come ready to participate in the singing with other believers. We come ready to lean in as, as the word is brought to us and we come ready to participate in that way. Bibles open, uh, ready to, to write things down as, as the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts. We are participating in that. I'm coming ready to engage with other people who are there on a Sunday morning um, to, to look to serve and love those in the body. And all of that, I believe God is going to use to foster a heart that is ready to respond to the Lord in praise and adoration to him. And so we come actively participating in the Sunday morning worship gatherings. I, I would encourage you with this. Look for ways to prepare your heart for Sunday morning. Look for ways to begin to prepare your heart to come ready to actively participate. And I would say that starts earlier than just Sunday morning at 8.59 when you're running through the doors trying to make the 9 a.m. service on time. Not that any of us do that, but, but if that's you, it's got to start earlier than just the 9 or the 11 o'clock service. I, I would challenge us, think of ways we can begin to prepare our hearts. Okay, how do we do this? I, I would tell you this, think about maybe your Saturday night or Sunday morning routine and start to implement uh, some of these practical steps. I would tell you pray. Pray over the Sunday morning gathering. Uh, pray for the service, pray for other brothers and sisters in Christ, pray for yourself, pray for your friends, pray for your family, that you'd be ready to receive the word that God has for you, whether that's from the, the word or that's a word that maybe a brother or sister is going to bring to you on a Sunday or that's a word that, that the Holy Spirit is just going to take from a song that we are singing together and, and use to pierce your heart. Pray. Pray over the Sunday morning gathering. Pray for the word that is going to be brought that God by his spirit would breathe life into it and there'd be people who are far from God who come to know God and we can actually begin to participate in the Sunday morning gathering by bathing it in prayer. And so I would tell you, pray. 
and pray before you get there on Sunday morning. This doesn't have to be hours, but even just for a few minutes, begin to pray over the Sunday morning gathering. What else can you do to prepare your hearts? Uh, read. Read a, read a psalm. Um, open up to a verse that maybe you're memorizing and just reread it. Um, I mean, there's some amazing tools. If you have the, the Bible app, there's like a verse of the day that you can get every day. Pull that out, look at it, and just say, okay, God, I'm going to pray this over our church this morning. And, and today, literally, the verse is, be still and know that I am God. And so I might look at that and go, God, would you help us as a church to be still? Man, we are so busy. We have so much going on, Lord. And I pray that this morning as we gather, or maybe if it's on a Saturday night, I pray that tomorrow as we gather, that you would help us to just be still, to take a breath, and to know that you are God and I am not. To know that you are God and we are not. Pray this over our Sunday morning gathering. And that can happen in like two minutes, but it begins to prepare your heart for church to be more than just a product I consume, but instead it's a body that I am a part of. And so there's praying, there's, there's reading. I would encourage you worship before Sunday morning. Get a, a playlist together of songs that God is using. Um, uh, think about a characteristic of God and, and meditate on that and dwell on that and begin to worship the Lord because of that characteristic. Um, be intentional about how you're gonna begin to prepare your heart for the Sunday morning gathering. You can do that through prayer, through reading, and through worship. But we must prepare our hearts. If we want to come ready to actively participate, we've got to prepare our hearts. Uh, there's a great quote from a Puritan preacher. He says this, Prepare to meet thy God, O Christian. The oven of your heart thus baked as it were overnight would be easily heated the next morning. The fire so well raked up when you went to bed would be the sooner kindled when you rise the next day. If you would thus leave your heart with God on Saturday night, you would find it with him in the Lord's day morning. I love that. There's preparation that is happening. We are kindling the fire as it were so that it's ready for some serious flame to happen on Sunday mornings as we gather. And so uh, worship practices. What does this mean? How do I begin to, to foster a heart of worship? Uh, number one, I'm actively participating in the Sunday morning worship gatherings. Number two is this. I'm intentionally creating consistent rhythms of praise to God. I'm intentionally creating consistent rhythms of praise to God. Now, two things that I want to press in on here, intentionally and consistently. That these, these rhythms of praise can't happen by accident. That there's got to be intentionality and there's got to be consistency around these things. That a heart of worship doesn't happen uh, just accidentally. I'm not just going to wake up tomorrow and be like, oh man, I am just overflowing with worship of God. This has got to be an intentional and consistent pursuit for us. And so I just want to talk about two things really quick on how do we do that? How do we intentionally, consistently pursue rhythms of praise to God? Now, the first thing is going to be like, well, yeah, I've of course, this is what this looks like. But I would encourage you, even more than just outside of Sunday morning, what are musical rhythms of praise look like for you? I'm intentionally creating consistent rhythms of praise to God. Let's talk about some musical rhythms of praise. That's a large part of what God calls us to. Again, time and time again in scriptures, we see the call for us as believers to sing to the Lord. And so what does this look like? Not just Sunday morning for 30 minutes when there's a band and loudspeakers and nobody can hear me sing, so I'll kind of sing kind of quiet so that I don't disrupt the people around me. And, but what does this look like Monday morning when you wake up? And honestly, this is where this gets really fun because you can get creative with it. I'll just throw out some ideas as I was, as I was thinking about this. Musical rhythms of praise. Um, make a playlist. Make a playlist of, your, of the songs that God is using in your heart right now. And maybe when you wake up in the morning for the first 10 minutes, I'm just going to have that playlist on. And I'm going to begin to engage with some of these songs as a way to, um, to begin to direct my heart towards worship of God, towards praise and adoration. Um, maybe it's, and I've done this before, where I have picked a song and every day on my way into work, I have listened to that song. And I'll listen to that song and then I will turn it off, and then the rest of that time, I'm just praising God out of what the Holy Spirit has used in that song in my life. I think we live in a culture where we always want the new, the new song, the new thing. The... But man, there's something sweet to like, what if we just sit in a song for a week, for a month? There's some things that God begins to do that we won't get if we just listen to a song and be like, oh yeah, sweet new song, and then move on to the next thing. 
And so I'd encourage you to take, uh, take a week, listen to the same song every morning, or maybe it's on your way to and, and from work, or maybe you're working at home now. Um, maybe it's just the first thing you do before anything else happens at work is I'm going to put that on or uh, whatever that might look like for you. But take a song um, and, and play it every day during the week and then just respond to the Lord in praise. Um, I would encourage you to sing together as a discipleship group. Um, and, and that can be some of the sweetest times of singing and of worship to the Lord. And, and there ought to be some intentionality and consistency around that, that we are singing together as a discipleship group in each other's homes. We are lifting up our voices of praise to the Lord. And so you can get creative with that. Maybe you're going, ah, there's nobody in our discipleship group that, that plays music. How do we do that? Um, we have some resources available for you of some set lists that, that we've recorded, uh, that we've actually recorded for a lot of uh, church online, especially during the COVID season. Um, we have those readily available for you that you can go on and use as a way to, to have some worship time in your discipleship group. Maybe it's just get a playlist of a song or two and you're going to sing through those on Spotify or iTunes or something. There's some, a lot of ways that we can do that, but get creative with it. Uh, sing together as a family. Um, if you are watching this and you're married, you have kids, I would encourage you to have some time together for family worship, family singing. Um, pick some songs together, teach your kids those songs, and sing together. Those are some of the sweetest times for me uh, in our home is around the piano and the kids are banging on the keys and it certainly doesn't sound good, but there we are singing, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. And to hear my kids just belting that out, and those are sweet, sweet times. For us. And so, again, I would encourage you to get creative with it, but think about musical rhythms of praise that you can begin to implement. But now, not only musical rhythms, but now non-musical rhythms of praise. That we are intentionally creating consistent rhythms of non-musical rhythms of praise. Okay, so, so what does that look like? Let's talk about some ideas. And again, you can get creative with it. It can look like so many different things for us. Um, a couple things that came to my mind. Pick an attribute of God and do a deep dive. There are so many resources just on this little thing right here that it, let's just say I want to I want to learn more about the holiness of God. Put in holiness of God in Google and maybe put in like a couple pastors that you trust after that. Holiness of God, John Piper. Holiness of God, J.D. Greer. Holiness of God, Matt Chandler. Whatever. Whoever comes to your mind. And, and then just begin to go through and study and deep dive and find some books and begin to get some books and look up scriptures and um, begin to meditate on those scriptures and, and God will begin to foster a deeper and deeper sense of praise and adoration to him as you, as you do some deep dives into uh, who God is. Um, uh, another way, non-musical rhythms of praise. Uh, pick a psalm and just praise your way through it. Um, and I'm, I literally just open up to a psalm right now. Um, let's say, uh, let's say Psalm 53. Uh, this is literally on the fly, so we'll see how it goes. But the point in this is, it doesn't have to have this big elaborate plan. Find some psalms, open up to them, and then just worship your way through. Um, here, Psalm 53. Uh, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. And I might stop there and go, God, I thank you that you are a God who looks down on us that you are a God who's not far off, that you're not some God who just kind of set the world in motion and then left us and said, oh, I hope they figure it out. But you are a God who, who looks down on us, who seeks us, who comes after us. God, we, we praise you for that. Later on in the psalm, it says, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. And I might stop there and go, God, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the future holds for me, but I thank you, God, that you are a God who restores, that, that you're a God who restores, and maybe not always in the way that I think or in the timing that I think, but I'm going to trust and believe, God, that you are, you are a God who restores and that we're going to look for the ways that you are restoring the broken pieces of my life, and I want to praise you and thank you for that. Again, that was just some random psalm. Um, you don't have to have this elaborate plan. Just open up, read through a psalm, and begin to praise the Lord through the psalm that you're reading and what you see. Um, read and pray your way through the lyrics of a song. Here I have the lyrics of King of Kings right here. I might grab that and say, okay, in the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light. God, man, I thank you that 
you didn't leave us in the darkness. We were waiting in the darkness. We had no hope. We had no light. Um, but you didn't leave us there. You pursued us. You came after us. And so, um, again, sometimes it might be just grabbing some lyrics of a song and read through those and pray through those. It might be getting outside in creation and let God begin to stir your heart through just being outside and seeing his handiwork. Um, there's so many different ideas. Just have fun with it. Get creative. Ask other people what they do. But the key is have some consistent and intentional rhythms of praise to the Lord in your life. And so, uh, again, we have these three practices. Number one, to, to foster a heart of worship. I'm actively participating in the Sunday morning worship gatherings. Number two, I'm intentionally creating consistent rhythms of praise to God. And then number three, I'm seeking awareness of idols in my life and accountability to destroy them. I'm seeking awareness of idols in my life and accountability to destroy them. As we think about worship, we want to address the things that keep us from worship. Uh, the Bible would call these idols. An idol is anything that sets itself up over and against the worship of God. And this isn't just like wooden statues that we have up in our house. Because if that's it, a lot of us would say like, oh man, I'm good. I, I, don't, I don't really struggle with idolatry. But instead... These are things that our hearts are drawn to that pull us away from the worship of God. The sin of idolatry starts in the heart. And our hearts are really good at making idols. John Calvin says this about our hearts. He says, the human heart is an, a factory of idols. Every one of us from their mother's womb is an expert in inventing idols. We are really good at pursuing idols almost anything but the Lord and worshiping and praising and adoring a lot of things other than God. And so part of fostering a heart of worship is I'm actively looking for the things that are pulling me away from the worship of God and I'm doing work to destroy those things and build up a heart of worship. We want to be so passionate about the praise and adoration of God that I'm actively looking for the things that are keeping me from that and we are destroying that. And so how do, how do we do that? How do we do that? A couple, couple practical things. Number one, we pray. We pray and ask God, God, reveal to me the idols of my heart. God, help me. Give me uh, power to destroy the idols of my heart, the things that my heart turns to and worships instead of you. And so we pray. We ask the Lord to help us destroy those things. Uh, number two, we've got to realize that destruction of idols in our life is a community project. It's not an individual one that I've got to be in community. I've got to have other brothers and sisters of Christ in my life who are going to speak truth, who are going to say hard things, who maybe are going to see some idols that I don't even see in my life. And then they're going to help me. They're going to hold me accountable to the destruction of those idols. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, not in mine, um, and through community, I believe we can see idols destroyed in our lives. But it's not going to happen by ourselves. It's got to be a community project. And so maybe you're sitting here going like, I mean, the idol thing, I kind of get it, but how do, I, how do I know? How do I know what the idols of my heart are so that I can begin to destroy those things? Uh, we're going to have a resource for you that just has some idol revealing questions, some heart revealing questions that are going to allow you to begin to wrestle with what those might be for you. And I'd encourage you, you can do that yourself. But I, again, we talked about this is a community project. Do it if you're married. Do this with your spouse. And you have to be humble enough to receive the answers. Uh, but, but do this with uh, a spouse or maybe if, if you are single, a really close, trusted friend. Um, but I would encourage you, again, this can be great by yourself, but invite some people in to work through these questions together. And I really believe God will reveal to you what some of those idols are so you can start to get to work destroying those idols together. And then I would encourage you, once you learn some of the idols that your heart is drawn to, begin to implement some, some really practical things that are going to help you fight against it. Uh, one example that I thought of is, is, let's just say that you find in your heart a continual draw towards uh, materialism. And, um, and you find that just in your heart, just having new things, and, and again, it might sound silly, but many of us live this way, that we, we put our trust in things and new things and, and a, a better house and this and that, like that's going to help me feel safe and secure. And so maybe that's you. And maybe you see that my heart is drawn toward this idol of materialism. I would encourage you, what are some habits that you can begin to implement to fight against that? And maybe it's, uh, I'm going to start at, a couple times a month, I'm going to go through the house and I'm going to begin to just get rid of things. 
and get rid of things that are easy, but then I'm also gonna throw in a few things that stretch me, that are hard for me to let go of, that are hard for me to, to give away. Um, begin to fight against that idol. Maybe it's, I'm gonna take a month and I'm not gonna buy anything new. I'm gonna take six months, we're gonna take a year, and I'm not gonna buy anything new. And, and that is gonna be a way for me to fight against the idol of materialism in my life. And so there's some intentionality around how I'm going about seeking to know the idol, but then seeking to destroy the idol in my life. And so uh, again, three things that are gonna help foster um, a greater worship of Jesus. These practices, I'm actively participating in the Sunday morning worship gatherings. I'm intentionally creating consistent rhythms of praise to God, and then I'm seeking awareness of idols in my life and accountability to destroy them. And I believe as we consistently and intentionally live these things out, we are going to see our hearts set on fire for praise and adoration to the Lord. And not just for an hour a week, not just for a couple hours a week, but for 168 hours a week, we are going to have lives that pour forth praise and adoration to the Lord. And so let's commit together. Let's commit together to seek after these things beyond just Sunday morning and beyond just a discipleship group. This is going to be a life of praise and adoration to the Lord.